Good day. Welcome to the Corey Morgan Show. We got a good one this week. I like to think they're all good. Some are better than others. We got to get realistic with things. And yeah, today's a good one. It's really addressing a pressing issue. In a little while, I will have uh, Premier Daniel Smith on. It was actually a recorded interview. We rarely do that here, but when, you know, the Premier schedule is tight and I just couldn't get her on live. So when that runs, though, I mean, I still, it's going to be running live on here. Use the comment area. Send your comments, ideas, questions on there, and I can address them after the interview. Uh, interact with each other. I like you seeing that comment scroll being used. It reminds me that we are live. Just keep things civil. Good to see you there, Rusty and Paradoxy and others. Feel free to check in. And, of course, there's going to be the rest of the news and other things going. So I'm going to start things off on a federal note, one of my pet subjects, our imbecile of a prime minister and his behavior of late, well, as always. So, I mean, the Trudeau government, though, they've been on the ropes for over a year. Polls have been abysmal, and it appears nothing's going to turn them around. So changing the leader of their party, I mean, it could improve their fortunes. It worked for the Democratic Party south of the border, but... Trudeau appears to be stubbornly unwilling to step aside no matter how unpopular he becomes. Now, the clock's ticking for the Liberals. They've got to be getting stressed. I mean, unless Trudeau steps down within the next couple of months, the Liberals won't be able to hold a leadership and have a new leader well enough established to head into an election in less than a year. They're basically going to have to accept him and, and get used to it. Aside from the usual campaign of trying to label all their opponents as being far right, you know, and scary and all that usual garbage, the Liberal tactic of trying to spin their way back into the hearts of Canadians has continued. Hardly a day goes by without a new spending announcement. And uh, with over a year expected at least to pass before the next general election, the Trudeau government's on track to spend Canadians into poverty for generations. The latest announcement comes from Napanee, Ontario, where a Goodyear plant is going to be getting $44 million tax dollars for an expansion. Goodyear is a large multinational corporation does not need corporate welfare from Canadians. They're not going to say no when Trudeau comes prancing in with a signed check from taxpayers in his hand, but they don't need it. The ones who are in need are the desperate liberals, and they're praying that somehow through corporate handouts, the potential new jobs they might create may reverse the downward spiral in the polls. Hasn't worked yet, but they're still doggedly trying, and it's pretty easy to do when you're writing checks with somebody else's checkbook. The subsidies are adding up to tens of billions of tax dollars when the mad lust for investing in battery plants to service electric vehicles that nobody wants is added up. While automakers are backing off from EV targets and cutting production, Canadians are having their tax dollars poured into companies with a mandate to supply EV manufacturing. In other words, a really stupid business decision and a recipe for financial disaster. Then there's the public service. With a decade in power, the Liberal government's managed to bloat uh, the already grossly large civil service by 40%. Services haven't gotten any better, though. We just have more people underserving us than ever before at a higher cost than we ever possibly could have imagined. Many of them went on strike last year and more have since been threatening labor action over having to come to the office more than two days a week. Job growth in the private sector in Canada remains stagnant. So that means we've got a smaller pool of people having to work more to pay a larger number of people to work less. Private sector workers are becoming tired and as much as Trudeau is trying to change that private to public ratio to win an election, there won't be enough civil servants hired to turn around an election, but they sure will break us. Trudeau's partnership with Singh's NDP is costing a fortune too. I mean, come on, nationalized dental services, daycare services, lunchroom services, pharmacare services, they're adding up to more billions of dollars that we can ill afford. Clearly though, the Trudeau government still somehow fears that Singh might pull the pin on their government, you know, if he ever found his... Uh, knackers and some courage it sings as happy as he's ever going to be and and if he tries to you know he tries to talk tough now and then but he's not going to go into an election he doesn't want to go there anymore any more than trudeau does but the liberals are still tossing billions into ndp initiatives to be on the safe side trudeau's government used to at least to pretend they plan had a plan to reach a balanced budget one day but they've tossed out those pretenses of fiscal responsibility and just now plan to increase the national debt indefinitely you know trudeau has realized that budgets don't balance themselves finally but the problem is he doesn't care. Government spending just keeps rising with the debt. It's anticipated that the program spending uh, is going to increase by another 18% by 28-29 if trends continue as they have. That estimate's going to keep growing as the announcements keep coming. The cost for servicing the debt's nearing $50 billion a year. Think about that. $50 billion a year in interest payments. is flushing money down the toilet, and it's as much as the federal government spends on health care. Worst of all, it's the future generations we're going to be left with the bill. Trudeau, he's eventually going to be tossed from office. He's never soon enough. 
He'll retire on some private island, live out his life in luxury. Meanwhile, young Canadians are going to have years of austerity when budgets have to be cut and taxes have to be risen when the nation hits the inevitable fiscal wall. Trudeau is the most irresponsible, selfish prime minister in Canadian history. He has no qualms about indebting generations in a desperate attempt to remain in power. Some people think that Trudeau should remain in power until the next election because his terrible leadership provides an advantage to the Conservative Party. And this might be true, but the price to keep that fool in power any longer than we have to is much too high. Trudeau is clearly never going to discover the concepts of personal accountability or empathy for struggling Canadians, but perhaps some Liberal caucus members will. They have to pressure that clown to resign as strongly as possible and as soon as possible. We just can't afford to keep him there any longer. All right. Well, that's kind of got me going. It's just, I can't, you know, opening the news and finding more spending, more spending. We just can't keep doing it, guys. Well, we'll see. All right. Let's see what the hell else is going on out there. We got our news editor, Dave Naylor, in studio with us today. Hey, Dave, what's what's topping the scroll today? Hey, it's nice to see you in a tie again. Yeah. You probably forgot you were wearing that, didn't you? It's just a, a temporary measure going on right now. <laughs> there you I can't go. Forget these things travel. Hey, nice, uh, nice get uh, having the premier on. That's always good, eh? Yeah, I get it. Well, you know, Premier Smith's been getting a lot of flack over the immigration issue. She she wanted to clarify a bunch of stuff. So yeah, I'm interested in hearing uh, what she has to say. Uh, leading off today, Corey, with a really disturbing story out of Calgary, where a, a dead kitten was found with its head. Uh, sort of caved in and uh, zip tied to a fence post uh, in the community of uh, Kingsland. So that's prompted a big uh, Calgary Humane Society investigation. And it turns out that since May, the end of May 30th, uh, they found uh, six kittens in and around that Kingsland Sandy Beach area that have been abused and had their like paws tied together and covered in tar and stuff like that. So there is one really sicko individual uh, out there. Uh, we've got our columnist, uh, Ruby, or sorry, Jaime Rubenstein, expert on Indigenous affairs, talking about the, the trend now to, to fake your Indigenous identity to get funding, federal funding for your business or, or, or whatever it may be. And that's, that's a good read. Big hailstorm is continuing to wreak havoc on WestJet. You should see some of the pictures of the, the wings of the plane just dented. And uh, they've had to cancel 600 flights. Uh, since the storm last week. And uh, if you phone the passenger hotline, you're told three days until an agent can get back there. So uh, that's uh, upsetting a lot of people. And interestingly, during their uh, little strike last month in July, they ranked dead last in North American Airlines for arriving on time. Uh, so I don't see their August stats uh, picking up anytime uh, soon. As you know, Corey, Winnipeg, uh, the uh, Canadian capital of Slurpee consumption. They love their Slurpees in Winnipeg, and they may have to go a bit further to get it. Now uh, uh, the corporation has announced they're closing 10 7-Elevens because of crime, and they're just in crime-ridden neighborhoods, and it's just not worth their while uh, to stay open anymore. You know, it's like shades of uh, San Francisco and, and stuff like that. Uh, Algerian boxer Caliph, uh, that was the uh, the. The, the boxer in the ladies competition with uh, male chromosomes. She is suing everybody and their dog for uh, defamation during the Olympics, including uh, Elon Musk and Donald Trump and uh, Arthur J.K. Rowling. So uh, French, uh, French officials are investigating and we'll have to see what happens there. And the liberals have resorted to their old tactic of blame Stephen Harper. Uh, this time it's for uh, letting those two ISIS, ISIS terrorists into the country and and uh, letting them go live in Toronto where they're planning to uh, kill as many people as they can. All Stephen Harper's fault. Shame on Mr. Harper. Uh, coming up uh, this afternoon right now when NASA is holding a press conference on those poor stranded astronauts who went up for a weekend and now maybe stuck there until next year. So our, uh, our own space geek, Sean Polzer, will be uh, filing a story on that. And our opinion editor, Nigel uh, Hannaford, is, uh, is pecking away on a, on a column on what's happening in Great Britain now. Uh, you know, well, I had some bad rioting and now people on, who are saying things on Facebook are being thrown in jail for more than a year. Uh, it's kind of what like Trudeau's proposing, you know, on these online harm harms bills. So he's taking a look at that, and it's uh, I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Well, lots on the burner. Always lots on the go. All right. Well, I'll 
let you get back at chasing those reporters around and keeping us all up to date on these uh, fantastic happenings. I'll do my best. Right on. Thanks. Thanks. All right. As you heard, that is our news editor, Dave Naylor. And yes, lots on the go. Boy, that kitten story, that's the first I'd heard of it, actually. I guess that's just, that's awful. There's something extra horrible about animal abusers. You know, I, I, I think it's part of why we get more upset when we hear about, you know, a senior citizen being uh, uh, attacked or a child or an animal is that they're helpless, right? You know, it's one thing if a, a grown person's assaulting another, it's still never good. Violence is never good. But kittens, good Lord, you know, and these are the things that we really need to take seriously. I mean, with some of the, the most horrible killers and, and, and uh, you know, sadistic individuals we get out there in the world that we uh, run across, almost always they have a history of violence towards animals. They start there. So let's catch this person in Calgary and any other animal abusers as soon as possible and, and just get this dealt with. What a, what a horrible, horrible thing to think of. Uh, so this is the time I'd like to remind you too, as you know, as you can see here, Dave's busy, Nigel's Billy, busy, Sean, Jen, Jonathan. Boy, so many names. we got a, a sketching reporter, BC reporter. The reason we've got all that going on, guys, is because you've been subscribing. So this is when I nag you to pay the bills a little. 10 bucks a month. $100 for a year, just like a newspaper subscription. You can get past that paywall, get straight through to these stories, these editorials, the rest of this stuff, and it helps support us so we can keep reporting. We're independent. We're not like that wretched CBC and the, you know CTV and the rest who keep getting their bailouts and tax dollars. We do not accept tax dollars. Nobody's, well, I guess they are kind of offering it to us if we wanted to try. We're not willing. We're independent. So if you've subscribed already, thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. If you haven't yet, come on, get on there, guys. Subscribe. Keep this rolling. Keep independent media functional. You know, there's a, a dark side to that. It's interesting, you know, the little trivia things you find out. So, yeah, Winnipeg is the, the slurpy capital of Canada. Uh, I didn't know that. You know, you wouldn't think that. So, okay, it was, it was popular for Slurpees. And now 11 7-Elevens are being shut down within Winnipeg because of the high crime. Something that's making, making a lot of news lately has been the list of the highest crime cities in the country. And, and people sometimes aren't thinking, you know, they're wondering, why isn't it the great big cities? It's it's smaller cities. And you look at who's topping it, and it's like Kamloops, and it's Chilliwack, and it's Red Deer, Alberta, it's Lethbridge, it's North Battleford, it's these smaller cities, Saskatoon, Regina, and Winnipeg. This is, you know, we were talking about immigration, we're talking about challenges and things that happen. This has nothing to do with immigration, actually. It is a social thing, though, and it's a demographic thing. That's one of the things we really do need to discuss. It's a sensitive area, very sensitive. But it shows how we, <clears throat> it's not a coincidence, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, every one of the cities that top the crime lists of violent crimes are also the cities that top the percentage of having uh, indigenous populations. And see, this is where it gets delicate because you don't want to label every indigenous person as a criminal. Of course not. I mean, the vast majority of them are not. But they're very very socially troubled, economically troubled. I mean, part of it is they're coming from reserves, they're settling in cities, and they're having a very difficult time adapting to city life. But we can't dodge and hide from that pattern. We can't ignore the reality that uh, this is uh, you know among the many measures. They got shorter life expectancies, bigger health problems, lower graduation rates. We have to accept that the system is failing. It's failing everybody, but it's failing the Indigenous people the most. This, this two parallel systems, the, this race-based policy we have. The irony is a lot of what messed up the Indigenous policy, you know, population socially over the, the, the generations was race-based policy to begin with. They were terribly treated. They weren't allowed to leave reserves without talking to an uh, Indian agent first. They were treated with a lot of terrible racism from people when they would leave the reserves. There was a lot of bad things done. But we're trying to fix it by applying more race-based policy. Guys, what we need to do is get race out of policy. We need to have discussions about what's working and what's not working. And this is not working for our First Nations in Canada right now and for other people who live in areas where the social disorder is spreading. Okay, now another issue. We're going to get into that right away here with my, uh, my guest. As I said, it's recorded. Keep the comments coming, guys. I'll read them uh, uh, while, you, while the interview is going. I had to record it with, with Premier Smith. But she'd recently, you know, well, not recently, but it recently kind of hit the news about an interview she did where she talked about doubling the population of Alberta. And a lot of people were wondering, what the heck is she talking about? What's she going on about? And uh, Premier Smith kindly 
came on the show and gave us 15 minutes to explain where she's coming from with uh, immigration and what Alberta can do about it. So uh, let's run that and, and listen to Premier Smith and, and uh, we can have a discussion on immigration. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Premier Smith, on an issue that's really, uh, well, a sensitive one and a big one with, with a lot of people, and, and that's immigration. Every level of government is dealing with it. Every citizen is dealing with it. Uh, I, I guess you kind of unexpectedly brought it into the fore again with, with an interview you did last January. Perhaps if we could start there, we're just kind of clarifying. You'd spoken of uh, aspiring to have Alberta double its population by 2050, and, and it got a lot of people pretty worked up. Can, can you kind of ex- expand on that a little? Well, my, my thinking about it was that we were, we're already growing at 200,000 a year uh, based on those numbers. So if you just do the math by 25 years, it would be 5 million population. And I have often thought that we would have more political clout if we had a higher population than Quebec. But but what I'm seeing, and I'm doing a lot of, of uh, roundtables and town halls across the province, people, people are worried. People are very nervous about uh, our ability to be able to keep up with that pace of growth. And I, I think we're beginning to, to see it. So I'm, I'm listening to people, I'm having to recalibrate a little bit on what our aspirations should be. I, I think what we really need is a sensible immigration policy, similar to what we had under Stephen Harper, where we had a point system for bringing people in. We made sure that newcomers match the economic needs of our economy. We made sure that we had a level of newcomers coming to our country that matched our ability to keep up with housing. And I, I think what we're what we're seeing is that, uh, especially in Alberta, we're beginning to, to feel some of the pressure of that growth. And I think that that's what people are responding to. Yeah, and I'd crunch the numbers because I admit, it's, as soon as I first heard it, I thought, boy, that's a pretty fast growth. And then I realized, well, actually, the, with where things went in 2023, if we sustain the current growth we're at, we will double by 2050, whether we aspire to do so or not. So the discussion has to be, I, I mean, you can't slow immigration. That's a that would be a federal move anyhow, but we really have to better deal with it. I, I mean, our health care is having a really hard time keeping up with our existing population. Housing is really pressuring people. Uh, the education system. So I, I, I guess through better targeting, we, we could better uh, you know, adjust to that and, and have them contribute to the growth that we need. But is that going to be enough? Like the numbers just sound so staggeringly large. Well, I, I think what we, I think 2023 may have been an anomaly. Um, I think one of it was that, that uh, when I got elected, we'd started into the Alberta is Calling campaign. And there was a, a good reason for doing that. I mean, we'd had 13 quarters of out-migration. We knew that we were going to turn around with an oil and gas and other building boom, and we needed to have workers here. But I, I think that uh, it was more successful than, than anybody an, anticipated it being, in part because we were one of the first provinces to firmly put... COVID behind us and the pandemic behind us, so that I think a lot of freedom lovers came to our province knowing that we were taking a bit of a different approach. I think as well that the housing proposition was such a good one. We still have several markets in Alberta that are are the cheapest in North America. I think Edmonton and Red Deer in particular. And of course, it coincided with um, the Ukrainian evacuees as well, 70,000 of whom came to Alberta during that period of time. And the remarkable thing is almost all of them got jobs. We just did a recent assessment of how many are on social supports, and it was only about 1,700. So I think those factors were part of what led to um, the, the the surge in growth. So so part of what, what we've done is we've, we've really scaled uh, we've scaled back that Alberta's Calling campaign just to target the skilled workers that we need. We're trying to get another, an additional 2,000 skilled workers to come here to be, so that we can keep up with the building growth of homes, keep up with the major industrial projects that we have in the industrial heartland and in the agri-food processing area and in the forestry sector. So that's that's part of, of how we have responded to that. But but I do think that the, the federal government has um, they've clearly led all of the different streams of uh, of immigration get beyond the ability of the uh, Canadian governments and provincial governments to be able to 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 properly support and you're seeing it. I mean, at the Halifax conference, every single premier was raising the concern about the increase in housing prices, increase in rents, 
the number of people using food bank, the number of people who are newcomers who are using shelters, the impact on education system, the difficulty finding a family doctor. Um, I think Albertans want to be able to em embrace newcomers who are going to participate in our economy, but but we have to do so at a rate that allows us to, to keep up with home construction, as well as keeping up with being able to provide all of those services. And right now, there, there is just way too much pressure on each of those. Uh, we're feeling it in government. I think, I think uh, regular Albertans are feeling it as well. And that's why we need to return to a more sensible kind of immigration policy like we used to have. So another area, and it's a more sensitive one, but people really need to address it, particularly when we see what's going on in the UK, mm -hmm. is, is, is people culturally integrating. I mean, some cultures have a, an easier time uh, adapting. I mean, Ukraine's got a similar climate. It, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of Ukrainian people who'd settled in Alberta previously, so they could quickly adapt to being here. Uh, from some of the countries, and, and they're countries that need, I mean, they have refugees that are coming, they're, they're fleeing some terrible situations, but they can have a, a hard time integrating with the existing population and people fear it might lead to the sorts of clashes and, and events that we're seeing in Europe right now. What, what could we do to, I guess, calm people and, and prevent uh, that sort of cultural clash from happening here over time? Yeah, I think you've identified another reason for unease. People are looking around the world and they're seeing that these uh, these disputes are spilling over into a number of different societies. And, and I, I don't think Albertans want to see disputes from other countries spill out into the streets here. And I, I think we've done a really good job of making sure that, that people are coming here for the values that we have in Alberta. I mean, we value family and faith and community and free enterprise and philanthropy. And there's so many, many uh, cultures around the world who are coming here so that they can live here in peace and harmony and have religious freedom and be able to raise their families and have a good job or start a business. And that's what we want to keep on doing. That's why having an economic focus on immigration makes so much sense. It assists with integration and it and it assists with making sure that those um, those uh, international disputes don't spill over into Alberta. So we have to be uh, very mindful of the, the nervousness people have when they look around the world and make sure that we're doing everything we can because if, if we don't have the ability to provide the supports, the English language learning, that first job, the ability to have wraparound supports to, to get a person into uh, a community to be able to support them long term, that's when you end up with people feeling disenfranchised. That's when you end up with, uh, with, with having some of, some, of, uh, some of that anger uh, spill over. And, and we, I think we've done a great job of being able to avoid that. And so I'm, I'm not um, as concerned about where we find ourselves now, but I, I am mindful that um, the, uh, the, this level of, of uh, continued pressure in Alberta is, is something that is going to, to, to be something we have to address. We, we don't want for it to spill over into people ha uh, feeling like there, there are, are too many newcomers coming to our province. We wanna make sure people will continue as they always have to embrace newcomers. But I think that the, um, the, the problem that we've seen is that everybody is feeling the increase in in the the cost of housing in key, increase of, in cost of living and the fact that we have a, a federal government who's essentially thrown out the immigration rules of the of the past and that is what's creating pressure not only here but uh, through to quebec and every other province as well it was part of the reason it was such a major topic of conversation when the premiers got together at the last round in halifax well, and some of the issue is just sheer volume. I mean, you know, some fantastic people coming, but you can just, you can only accommodate so many at, at so much of a speed. Now, Quebec has always been outspoken and, and at least, you know, controls as much as they can provincially in immigration, even though the at the base of it, it is a federal thing. Are there more policies we can look forward to from Alberta to try and take more control, at least of our own destiny as to controlling it? immigration for, for ourselves well let me let me tell you the way i'm looking at this so we're about 12 percent of the population and yet we ended up with 22 percent of the the newcomers in the 22 23 or 23 calendar year that that's gives you an idea of um of just how much additional pressure it is that that we've been bearing the other thing i would say is that our home builders have been amazing because they've seen the extra pressure so they've massively wrapped up their construction and now we're building um 56 more houses this year than we did last year which uh would allow for us 
to build about 40,000 homes this year, which they tell me can accommodate about 100,000 people. So that is going flat out. So I hope that that gives you some idea of the what, what I've seen um, our, our housing uh, capability is, as well as what I'm seeing in the in the social services area. We, we know that we're seeing uh, an increased pressure in uh, shelter on food banks, and we, we want to make sure that that doesn't continue. So part of the, the approach that I've always taken is that I've watched what Quebec has done. Quebec has the ability to choose about 55% of the newcomers that come to Quebec because they're choosing on the basis of language. I just saw recently that um, Quebec wants to take over their entire um, immigration um, uh, choices. And uh, whereas in Alberta, we only get the ability to choose about 9,500 of the newcomers through our provincial nominee program. It, it seems to me that having more ability for us to use that program so that we can attach workers to the jobs that are available and make sure that we have the supports of the communities around them, that would make a lot of sense. So I have been advocating for that, that we should be able to, much more like Quebec, have greater uh, ability to have the the selection over those who do come to Alberta so that we can make sure that they're going to be um, a good fit and also be able to to seamlessly integrate and be able to have the jobs and the and the social supports to support them then I'll continue advocating for that but the general issue is that we we simply as a country cannot bring in 1.2 million people. That is, that is, I believe, through all the different streams, uh, the family stream, the refugee stream, the, the student stream, the temporary foreign worker stream, and the regular integration uh, immigration stream that came in in 2023. And I think we've just seen, um, whether it's in Alberta or Quebec or elsewhere, that there just isn't the ability for the, the provinces to keep up and there just isn't the ability for the housing market to keep up. Back in um, Mulroney's day, I think Mulroney had 250,000 newcomers. That was his immigration target. It, got, it advanced more under Harper. I don't know, quite know what the numbers are, but but going back to something uh, that is based on what is our ability to be able to effectively build houses and support newcomers, that's gotta be the number. It can't just be an open borders policy without limit. It's, it's just creating way too much pressure on every province's social programs. And it's also putting a, a lot of pressure on, on uh, people being able to ha aspire to ha ultimately have a home one day or ultimately be able to have an affordable rental suite. Those things are all connected and we have to, to make sure that we're taking care of Albertans. Yeah, and then, so before I, I let you go, I mean, there's some reactionary people who say we shouldn't have any immigration. That's unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Immigration is a net benefit to us. We, we do do well with immigration and it's important. But uh, as you said, that the 1.2 million a year is unsustainable as well. Do, do you have a sort of number you think that maybe unified premiers could be asking the federal government to just tap the brakes on and bring us to that's sustainable? Well, you know, I, I guess, is there like a 1% kind of target? If you look at, we have 40 million people in Canada right now. If it was 1%, that would be about 400,000. When I look at, at whether or not um, our share would be able to accommodate that, I think we probably could. If you look at our historical growth before we ended up with a, a major downturn in our economy that lasted for so many years. So maybe that's the right number. I mean, uh, there's, probably, there's probably smarter people than me who can figure that out. But I can just tell you from what I have now observed, about uh, trying to uh, provide the services uh, to accommodate uh, folks who, who came here through 2023. I think we had the ability to do some of that more effectively because we had had so many years of decline and we had some housing uh, projects that had um, uh, had started up. And so we were able to, to, uh, to I think, do a, a pretty good job of being able to match that, that growth pressure. But now I'm looking at the the fact that we've got uh, you know 22,500 additional students that came into school that we weren't anticipating and it takes three or four years to build a school we, we probably need to build uh 30 or more schools a year for the next uh number of years in order to be able to keep up with the, that growth that's the kind of practical reality that i'm talking about is that um if we're if we're going to to be welcoming newcomers we've got to have a place for them to live and a place for their kids to go to school and we've got to make sure everybody has a family doctor so i think that there is um, a very pragmatic and practical approach that we can take that allows us to continue to to keep up with growth continue to welcome newcomers without creating the kind of tensions that are, are beginning to emerge because uh, because people are beginning to feel disenfranchised great well I, I appreciate you coming on to clarify that for us today is, is there anything else you'd like to add before i let you go 
No, th thanks so much for the for the conversation, Corey. I know that you guys uh, um, do a, a lot of work on covering these and, and other issues. I mean, the other thing I might say is uh, one of the things I was just on a northern tour, and it's very interesting to see the difference between north and south, because north keeps telling me we need more people. But one of the things that they're doing up north is they're, they're trying to grow their own, uh, their own skilled labor. They're offering more trades programs to, to kids or having larger families. And we are also a party that supports families. We're doing what we can to, to be able to make it easier for families to be able to have kids, for moms and dads to both be able to go back to, to work so that they don't have to choose between having kids and, and working. That's part of the reason why we have the daycare program that we do. And, and we're going to do both. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the, the things that has made Alberta so strong is that we always have had a much younger population here. And so we've got a higher workforce participation rate. We've got higher wages on average, and that allows for all of us to pay lower taxes. So I kind of like that as part of our model as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on today. And I hope we get to talk again sometime soon. You bet. Thanks, Corey. Okay, so that was 15 minutes of Premier Smith talking about immigration. It, it's a huge issue, but we, you know, we got to clarify a few things. Like for one, it's federal. Uh, no matter what the premier may say or may try or may do, uh, all she can do as far as it comes to the volume is lobby the federal government. We can't stop interprovincial migration. That So the volume coming in, the 1.2 million, which you know she did say is, is not sustainable, uh, that is in Trudeau's lap. That's a federal policy. Then they land in Canada, and Alberta's growth, it's been showing, our growth is... Uh, uh, mostly interprovincial. They land in Toronto, they land in Vancouver, but they do come to Alberta eventually. And we have to deal with the immigration. It's not going to go down no matter what we do provincially. It has to happen federally. And now, uh, Nadia pointing out in Quebec, it's provincial. Yes and no. So what happens in Quebec is they have a larger say on where the immigrants will first land and, and choosing which ones will get there. And they base it on language, as was said. But again, it's federal and there's nothing that Quebec can, can do, say, for a liberal that moves, or liberal, an immigrant that moves to Toronto and decides to move to Quebec. There's nothing the province can do to stop that. So we got a few things to discuss. Some people saying no immigration, no immigration. I'll be blunt. That's stupid. It's stupid. Okay, guys? We need immigration. What we need to do, though, is do it better. We need to figure out how to manage it. I, I, you know, I, I did a lot of touring talking about the Alberta pension plan, a, a big thing I've been a pro proponent of for a long time. And one of the reasons Alberta is much more strongly placed with a pension plan of its own rather than being in the federal one is the demographics. Because Alberta has a younger working population. Because Alberta has a higher earning population, we're putting much more into that plan than we're taking out. But the reason we have that balance is a lot because of immigration, because the immigrants are working and they're feeding that system, that's the way the, the uh, pension plans work. And if we stopped immigration, if we could, if we could wave a magic wand and stop immigration, that's fine. But we're going to have a terrible imbalance with things like our pension plan and developing areas and moving further. We're getting too many. That's a given. You, you know, Premier Smith said as much as well. We're taking in way more than we can accommodate. But the solutions aren't as simple as some people might think. And uh, we, we have to think harder on this. We can't as Albertans do much well. Hey, I wrote a book on what I think Albertans should do about dealing with Ottawa in the long game, you know, with the, the sovereignist handbook. But in the immediate term, there's only so much a premier can do to adapt to these things. She did say, interestingly, and that was back in January, that uh, uh, she was looking at doubling Alberta's population by 2050. The funny thing is, as I looked into it, that is, she wouldn't have to do anything. She'd just have to leave it alone because at the rate that it's increasing, that is what would happen by 2050. We do need to scale that back. We need to lessen it. But there's other points, like foreign students. Paradoxy brought that up. Said no more foreign students. Fair enough. But again, you see, people forget how that's integrated. Foreign students going to post-secondary schools pay a massive premium. They pay far, far more for tuition and all the rest than Canadian citizens who are attending the post-secondary, the colleges and universities do. They subsidize the education for the other Canadians because they pay so much extra. So if we did end all of the foreign students, I think, again, I agree, we're taking in too many, but if we ended it all, okay, but the tuition costs for the remaining Canadians are going to go up. That's just the way it's going to go. And uh, 
you know, we, we have to work on screening. It's a, we, we talked about that. Uh, are we bringing in immigrants who best can integrate with us? I think absolutely not. We, we look at the integration issues going on in the UK and Europe. We talked about that. No, it is not going well at all. They're insular communities. They're fighting with each other, and it's becoming bad. So we've got to work on tempering and controlling those numbers. Again, that's completely out of provincial jurisdiction. There's nothing we can do about that as a province except really push the federal government as much as we can. And Trudeau, Trudeau is trying to pour the immigrants into Canada as hard as he can. There's a reason for that. Because when you bring the immigrants in, it holds up the one and only data point he has as a positive economic indicator. You see, immigrants bring in, they add to the GDP as a whole for the country, the gross domestic product. So they come in, they work, some bring funds with them, resources with them. It raises that number. So he can point and say, see, see, Canada's growing, it's doing well, it's doing well. What he overlooks, of course, is the GDP per capita goes down because we're splitting it among a much larger population of people. Um, see here, you know, I've got a comment here. I'm not going to fully quote him. It's Razo 5000, and he's a fool. You know, zero immigration. Okay, sure. Why don't we wave a wand and make everybody rich too? Let's have a realistic conversation on this because it's a real problem. We've got a real issue with getting an, uh, a manageable number of immigrants coming in and uh, accommodating the people who are already here and of course accommodating the immigrants when they get here as well. Hey, it's not a all uh, uh, sunshine and happiness for immigrants who get here and find out how expensive rents are and uh, how difficult it might be to find a decent job in some areas and sectors and things like that. Again, that's a, a symptom of us taking in more than we can manage. But we can't go to zero. It's uh, not a, a much of an option. Uh, Ariel Sky saying, uh, go look at the homeless. What do you see? I see uh, actually a massive addiction issue going on with the homeless. And uh, most of the uh, uh, people I see on the street actually are First Nations or white. Uh, I don't see a lot of Middle Eastern or uh, Indian or Asian people actually on the street with the homeless. Uh, that's a whole separate discussion as well, actually. I think a lot of immigrant communities are a lot better at uh, uh, supporting family and so on, so they don't end up in that, that, that circumstance. Uh, but, you know, we get these things going. Helen Moa saying, is the Western standard sort of biased? No, but I am. I'm an opinion host. Of course I'm biased. I've got my view. That's what I do. I share it on here. But, uh, you know, I, that's the way it goes. The news, no, the news is unbiased. But the opinion writers and people like me, yeah, I've got my biases. But I, I, I just, uh, we, we have to get our things in order. And we have to have a rational conversation about it. Some people are getting really upset with Smith. Oh, I'm going to go to the AGM. I'm going to vote against her. I'm going to vote against her. Okay, it's fine. Just remember that uh, <laughs> Ninchi is in the background. And uh, waiting for the UCP to rip itself apart. And if you think things are bad uh, with, with Smith, just uh, imagine Ninchi as a premier. Uh, John Smith, wow, what a boomer windbag. I love some of these commenters here. And I'm, I'm glad you were honest enough to put a fake name, you know, as John Smith to put it in to begin with. Yeah, for now, I'm no spring chicken, but uh, I'm actually Gen X. I'm not a boomer, but I am a windbag. And that's what I'm about. I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm telling you what you need to hear. And that is that we need realistic immigration policies, but we can't realistically get rid of all immigrants or stop it. Uh, L says, Smith is finished. We got options. Oh, okay. Name them. I mean, I, I, I was, I've spent years in, in politics in Alberta, a lot of them very involved in the party executives on, uh, uh, you know, a political organization managing campaigns. And I tell you what, we we love ripping ourselves apart politically, don't we? Infighting, going at it, ripping out our leaders. And uh, how well did that work when we got Premier Notley for four years? What does somebody see? Yes, I think people should go to the AGM of the party that's in power. I think they should speak their minds. They should they communicate it to the party. The UCP isn't perfect by a long shot. But Smith's only been... Uh, in for, you know, less than a couple of years, do you really think tearing her out is going to help at this point? And where are the alternatives? What's out there? What do you see? 
one of the other fringe parties out there, the Alberta Advantage Party, I think they got a couple hundred votes the last time around. One of the four or five independence parties we got running around these days, I don't know. But, uh, you know, again, we need to be realistic about some of these things and uh, talk about it. I mean, hey, we have a premier who came, whether people don't trust her or agree with her, but she came and gave 15 minutes to explain uh, what, you know, what her stance was and, and where these things are. <sighs> Yeah, I'm just reading some of these Paul, you know, comments. Man, some of you guys are crackpots. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm not fully sane myself. Uh, you know, Tommy Gunn, how about closing the door on immigration? Well, how about getting realistic? Let's get on with things, guys. Let's talk seriously about it. Not all this reactionary crap. You're not going to get anywhere. And, uh, we, you know, we've got work to do. But we need to be smart about it. And, you know, let's talk about some of the other things. I'll, I'll start turning a little. Because this is some of the news coming up. This is some of the problems we have due to having uh, way more immigration than we can manage. It's a federal thing. We can't do much about it provincially. But it is a federal thing, and it is a problem. And here's a, something that uh, Trudeau talked about using federal property for more housing, you know, and it's military property and, and things such as that. And... Uh, it's showing now that uh, a quarter of the national defense buildings he was talking about, they date from the 1970s or even earlier. They, they're inappropriate. They're full of asbestos. They're out of date. They're small. They're nasty. You know, Trudeau and his foolishness, it just never stops. The bottom line is we have more demand than we have supply. And again, that comes to having way too many people coming in and we can't accommodate them fast enough. We can't build the houses fast enough. As Premier Smith said, we would need to build 30 new schools a year in Alberta just to keep up with the schools for the children for the ones coming in. We've got to scale things back and get realistic with it. And unfortunately, we're not getting federal help. <laughs> I mean, this is bad friggin' news. This is another one. Uh, Commons Public Safety uh, Committee uh, agreed to summon cabinet ministers over suspected failures in immigration security checks. You think? I mean, yes, we brought in uh, th this fella who, uh, thankfully, and it turns out it was from French intelligence, uh, from France, not uh, Canadian intelligence, realized that these uh, this father and son team were going to pull off a terrorist act in Canada. They were going to chop people up. They were going to do some horrible, horrible stuff. And it turns out that the father had been on video with ISIS dissecting a man hanging from ropes before. How, how is it our immigration can't catch even the most horrific of psychopaths coming from other areas? I mean, we're talking some people who slipped through if they had no record, no history, no things going on. Okay, that happens. But this, this was brutal. And, and as Dave said in the story as well, uh, you know, when he was in talking, giving the updates, the liberals are trying to blame... Harper somehow. 10 years ago, Harper was in, guys, but they're trying to blame Harper for this guy and uh, this mess. But then we got to look at where we're putting our money with some of this other idiocy. This is another interesting one that popped up. Uh, people familiar with uh, uh, crazy left-wing tax-funded groups, the Anti-Hate Network. You know, these are one of the things that drives me nuts at Quell's discussion, because if they cloak themselves in a name like Anti-Hate Network, well, we must be doing something good, right? Not necessarily. Uh, it's just like Antifa says, do you, uh, you know, well, we oppose fascism. So if you don't like us, does that mean you like fascism? No, actually, it doesn't. It just means I think you're a nutcase and I don't like fascism. In fact, I don't have to like either of you. But we've had the, the tax dollars go towards this anti-hate network. And this anti-hate network is nuts. These guys are more hateful than most others. And it turns out uh, that the guy heading it is this anarchist. And uh, he deleted his Twitter account records recently, but it's too late. It's out there. He was putting out insane stuff. And this is the anti-hate network. I mean, he was talking about, uh, you know, he was demonstrating outside cracker barrels and things like that. This is where your tax dollars go. This is the other end of the coin. This is, for, you know, going from, from kooks who think that we can stop immigration altogether to kooks like this guy who with the anti-hate network that uh, <laughs> just uh, doesn't... Uh, doesn't quite get it. And then let's get into human rights. You know, the head of the Human Rights Commission, that hit recently, uh, Bruju Dutani, who was a, appointed to the head of the hate network, or hate network, human rights, uh, Canadian Human Rights Commission. See, it's hard to keep up with all these things, all your tax dollars and all this stupidity. And uh, yeah, all they had to do is Google and have a look. And hey, this crackpot basically said terrorism is a valid, good way to make change. This guy was literally pro-terrorist and he gets appointed as the head of the Human Rights Commission. It's no wonder 
we're having problems with, uh, uh, you know, people are having problems with the integration and so on. When these are the people fostering division, they're getting us fighting with each other even more. And uh, they're, they're supporting insane, insane things. Uh, as well, well, you know, again, if everybody wants to scream and blame immigrants for everything, but we've got other issues. Uh, the RCMP, another big federal organization that's not serving as well. I certainly ripped into them hard enough the other week. Alberta had that recent uh, murder uh, of an innocent young man who was just working uh, for the county um, so they could steal his vehicle. They did catch one of them. He's in jail. They're see seeking out the other one, Elijah Strawberry. They're trying to find him. But the RCMP still isn't sharing much information with us. This is where it gets maddening. This is one of our systems falling apart, where they don't realize they serve us, not the other way around. They should be giving us pretty much all the information they can because that's their job and it's sharing it with us. This is, again, how we keep ourselves safe, how we know what's going on out there. And it's like pulling teeth with these guys. Getting back to things we can do provincially, we can do a provincial police force should. We can do a provincial pension plan. I talked about that earlier, but we need that demographic to make it a good advantage. And hey, I hate to say it, guys, but we need immigration for that. It, it, it's funny. I, you know, I, I had a bunch of people all worked up because I put a picture out a while back of a, a woman with like, I don't know what it was, 12 kids lined up next to her and everything else. And I said something about her not using her reproductive organs as a Pez dispenser or something like that. People go, you're anti-white breeding. You you want to see the, the white uh, wipeout. These white families annoy you and they get on. Holy cow, you hypersensitive wimps. You hypersensitive wimps. You know what? I'm not worried about the white race being wiped out. If you're that worried, get better in bed because you're not keeping up. You know, stoop better. You're not, the, the average family is only producing, what, 1.3 kids or something nowadays. It's not enough. So if, unless we want the population to go down, we need to bring people in. And if you really think it's up to everybody to reproduce naturally more, that's fine. Well, you get started and you get on it. But in the meantime, if you look at an economics book, we need to bring folks in. Either way, I'm glad we could have a rational, calm discussion. I, I see you know, well over a thousand and some people uh, viewing this live as we're talking. And of course, uh, I see uh, the crackpots like uh, at the end saying, hey, this guy's another racist who hates the European race. No, I hate morons like you. But I appreciate you tuning in and be sure to visit our advertisers. All right, that's all I got today, guys. It was fun. I'll be back next week with a bunch more. Be sure to tune in to the pipeline tonight and we'll be talking about a bunch more. And hey, I'm sorry you white guys are scared. I'm not, and I'm white. I got over it. Talk to you next week, guys.